to this computer. Okay, so today is a very interesting lecture about uh, Bayesian statistics. Well, uh, I just listed a lot of terms with the word Bayesian or related to, to this. So we have, of course, Bayes theorem, Bayesian probability, Bayesian versus frequencies arguments, Bayesian thinking, analysis, approach, framework, optimization, learning, inference, prediction, naive Bayes, which is a class of machine learning models, uh, Bayesian network, uh, Bayesian neural network. And then we have other related terms like conditional probability, prior, likelihood, posterior, belief, support, survivorship bias, generative model, parameter estimation versus hypothesis testing, Bayesian interpretation, naive bias classifier, Gaussian naive bias classifier, Gaussian process in Bayesian optimization, and conjugate distributions, conjugate priors, a lot of stuff. I will not be able to cover everything in detail. It's a big topic. Um, so here I put uh, some videos which I liked some of them I really, really liked. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend to like, download them on your phone and uh, spend some time watching, subscribe to these channels. These are all um, very good videos. And these are more resources. There are books, uh, very good books. I, I own all of these books. I bought them, uh, read them. So big topic. So let's first start with uh, Thomas uh, Bayes. And uh, well, it was a long time ago, right? It was like, what, uh, 300 years ago, almost. And uh, he hasn't actually published the theorem. Um, there were some observations, um, which uh, later after his uh, death were presented. And then Laplace uh, put some mathematics on top of it. But um, the Bayesian uh, the theorem is actually a very, very simple idea. And uh, I want to uh, show it uh, on this example. So we have all people, and some of them, class A, are happy people, and some of them, class B, are rich people. And then we have intersection. So a certain proportion of A people are also rich, and a certain proportion of rich people are happy. Right. So uh, in order to get the total amount of people who are both happy and rich, you can uh, go from either direction. You can take all happy people and then multiply it by proportion of rich people inside happy or vice versa. You can start with rich and they take proportion of happy inside rich. So here uh, I put some numbers to it. This is just an example. So suppose that uh, happy people, uh, which is yellow here, uh, constitute 40% of overall population. And rich people constitute 5% uh, of overall population. Now suppose that fraction of rich people from happy people is 10%. So this vertical, that actually in probability, that means conditional probability. So uh probability of being rich uh, given that uh, happy is 10 percent um, in other direction probability of happy being rich is 80 percent no note that they are not equal they don't have to be so you can see it on this picture most of rich people are happy but most of happy people are not rich so these two numbers are different that's okay and then we calculate intersection of A and B, so this green area, and it's actually 4%. And you can calculate it of uh, like starting with uh, B, uh, rich, and then fraction of rich, which are happy. So you multiply the numbers, you get 4%. Or you can start with happy and then multiply a fraction of rich inside happy, and you get 4% again. So here I expressed it as, as a table. And uh, you can take uh, these two things, right? Because they represent the same thing. They just represent the green area here. And you can write it as uh, one formula. 
And this is Bayes theorem, a theory, a theorem of a conditional probability. So as you see, it's very trivial, it's very intuitive, it's very simple. So probability of A given B times probability of B is the same as probability of B given A times probability of A. So you can uh, sometimes see it like this, where you can divide it by PB and then you get this formula. So very simple. Um, there are some naming conventions, posterior, prior, likelihood, evidence. I don't want to confuse you for now. So let's <laughs> not use this. I mean, I will still use it. Okay, here is a, a simple example. Well, maybe not so simple, but uh, suppose we're making uh, two tests in a row. So we have epidemic and every like one out of 100 people have a disease. Uh, so we have a test which gives like one out of 120, uh, 110 uh, tests which are given, it gives positive result. Uh, so this is just, we know this statistical number. Uh, so we know that the result is positive. We don't know if people uh, actually have the disease or not. Um, but then we have another piece of data that given that we have a disease, the probability of getting positive result is 0 0.8. So what it immediately tells us that this test, of course, is not perfect, right? So it only catches like 80% of uh, people who have disease. Okay, so question, what is the probability of having the disease if we did just one test and the result is positive? So test is positive, should I be scared? And uh, so if uh, D is event of having a disease and T is event of having a positive test, so we can use uh, Bayes theorem uh, to write it like this. So probability of positive test given the disease, which is 80% times probability of the disease, which is one out of 100 divided by overall uh, uh, probability of positive test, which is one out of 110 people. And we get this number. Okay, so this is uh, probability of having disease after one test. So now let's do two tests. So we have two independent tests. And uh, what is the probability of having disease if both of them are positive? So here I just uh, copy pasted from this link stack overflow. Uh, they analyze it and the answer is that it's almost one. So it's almost certainty that you have the disease, right? Okay. So base uh, help us base thinking. So how you go, if this happened, then next happened, then next happened, uh, helps us uh, to make uh, decisions to estimate uh, probabilities. So this is a good example of uh, Bayesian thinking. Uh, Bayesian versus uh, frequentist uh, survivorship bias. Um, I will talk about base versus frequentist in, in the next several slides. Uh, but here is the problem. So during World War II, the US military wanted to improve their planes. They wanted to protect certain uh, parts of the planes. Uh, and uh, they uh, looked at the planes uh, who came back to the airport. They counted number of bullets. So these are the maps. And they said, okay, in this, sites where there's a lot of bullets. So it looks like these are places which were hit mostly. So we need to protect these places. But uh, uh, this statistician, Abraham Wald, uh, he said, no, this is actually absolutely wrong. Because if planes still came to the airport, that means that they survived. And these uh, places which uh, no hits, these are probably the most sensitive. And when they hit in these areas, the planes go down and they don't return. So he said, gentlemen, you need to put more armor plate where the holes aren't, because that's where the holes were on the airplanes that didn't return. Okay, so this was 80 years ago. And this is a very interesting consideration. So frequentists, they simply, uh, calculate the amplitude, like uh, the 
uh, points of uh, concentration, uh, the mean value and something like that. So they just uh, treat the data as is. Whereas Bayesian approach is to think what happened before that caused this situation, right? And this is uh, what Abraham Wald uh, was doing. So this is a famous uh, survivorship uh, bias uh, example. So there are some videos explaining it and uh, I like highly recommend to read more about the story. So this problem occur when we have either underrepresented features like missing data, and that's what we had here, or overrepresented features or some target leakage effect. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, this is a very important slide about Bayesian approach, about Bayesian data analysis. So Bayesian approach is a method of figuring out unknown. So we have the data, we have observed data, but we don't know what uh, happened uh, to cause this data to appear, right? So we're trying to figure out these unknown parameters. So we have some unknown parameters, which are priors, and we don't know them. We then can have some sort of a model, which again, completely fictitious. We just invent it. We think what may be the model? So this is very subjective. And from that, we try to get observed data, right? So this approach is very subjective. So it's a Bayesian data analysis, a method of figuring out unknowns. It requires two things, the data, which we're trying to fit, right? Some sort of generative model to generate this data and some sort of priors, uh, some distributions of something which we don't know, but we can, Yes, we can make some reasonable assumptions of what they could be, and there may be more than one prior. Okay, um, so note about priors, prior distributions. Uh, uh, Bayesian approach uh, is to treat uh, beliefs as probability. This is actually a very common human way of thinking. Okay, uh, th this is interesting slide. Uh, so in uh, Bayesian, we don't really know uh, which modal parameters are true. And we suspect that it may be hundreds of them and they all are true, but with different probability. So we may have uh, different models as long as they fit the data somehow. So we can assume that all of them have the right to exist. Whereas in the frequentist approach, we calculate the mean value, we create our interval, and we test the hypothesis, like we either accept or reject. So uh, frequentism is a recipe for generating confidence intervals. And uh, so you see there's a different approach. Uh, okay, I will not go deeper into that. Uh, frequentist uh, versus uh, Bayesian thinking. Uh, frequentist thinks that a P of A, so we're, we're talking about, uh, again, this theorem, Bayesian theorem, right? And uh, frequentist uh, treats P on A and P and B as proportions of outcomes. And P of B given A is the proportion of outcomes B out of outcomes A. So it's just frequencies. Uh, whereas the Bayesian interpretation is more based on beliefs uh, of like what happened before, like if A happened and what was the probability. And uh, so this is a different way of thinking. And again, another slide talking about the same thing. Uh, so frequenti frequentists accuse Bayesians for being subjective in selecting their prior models or distributions. And Bayesian says that at least they have some sort of a model, maybe even subjective, uh, whereas frequentists just calculate averages of observed data. And as we've seen, like in this, like just calculating the average leads you in completely wrong direction. So you better have some sort of a model, some sort of a view which describes what actually happened uh, before. Okay. 
now I want to talk about uh, naive Bayes uh, classifiers. It's a very, very simple idea, and uh, this example hopefully will make it uh, easy to understand. So you see, we have some features, like is it rainy, overcast, or sunny? And we have temperature, hot, mild, or cool. We have humidity, and we have windy. And this is historical data. So on certain day, we had uh, some of the weather parameters, and we either play golf or didn't play golf. So what we want to do is, given the set of the features, predict whether we will play golf or not play golf. And approach is really trivial. So for example, let's say we look at all rainy. So we have rainy one, two, three, four, five rainy, right? And then we look out of these uh, five rainy, how many yes and how many no. Uh, so actually we can do it uh, differently. We can look at yes and no and look uh, how many of them, like if yes, how many was rainy or if no, how many was rainy. So let's look at how many yeses we had. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We had nine yeses and we had five no's. And in nine yeses, we have only two rainy and they're here and here. So, so this is this conditional probability and, and so for no. So suppose that for each of these uh, uh, features of, uh, uh, of uh, weather, uh, we uh, have this uh, conditional probability. So given yes, what was the probability of uh, being rainy, right? And uh, what given yes, what's the probability of like being hot and whatever. So now if we uh, got a data point, which can, uh, has outlook, temperature, humidity, and windy, for each one of them, we can multiply those probabilities uh, for yes, and then we can multiply similar probabilities for no. And we just compare which one is bigger. And this will allow us to make a decision whether we will play golf or not. So it's a very, very simple uh, approach. And uh, what we're doing here is we presume that each one of these features has the same influence on the outcome. And that these influences are independent from each other. So it's a very naive way of thinking about the problem. That's why it's called a naive base. And uh, base because it's conditional probability. Okay, uh, this slide uh, describes it, uh, well, maybe a little bit more explicitly. So the main naive assumption is that each feature makes an independent and equal contribution to the outcome. Uh, although in real life features may have interdependencies and may have different importance, right? So here we have the result that the person is fit. And then we have two features. One is that he exercises daily and another he's a dog owner. And we're trying to like using the base theorem to write. So what's the probability of fit given those two features? And we just write it as a Bayesian formula. And then we decide that the probability of fit given these two features actually because they're independently uh, acting, we can split it into two probabilities separately and multiply them. So this is this naive assumption of the naive uh, base classifier. Okay, uh, here there is a little bit more discussion. I will not uh, go into this. Uh, just one uh, thing is that we're splitting uh, on the top, but we actually don't split at the bottom because we can't. Uh, but in making decision like go, no, go, golf, no, golf, you don't need uh, the denominator, the bottom, because all you need to do is to compare the top portions. So the model still works. Uh, okay, next, uh, Gaussian naive base classifier. Although it's also called naive base classifier, but this is a completely different thing. And here we have 
uh, continuous data, which uh, supposedly have Gaussian distribution, and we're making some assumptions, and we can also do classifications. So I will not go into this, but uh, just for you to know that when you say naive uh, base classifier, you need to like maybe ask a question, what kind of classifier it is. Okay, uh, this is a very famous work done in 2006. Uh, so we're talking about uh, Canada, Toronto, uh, famous uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who was uh, later invited to work at Google and he's, uh, well, uh, genius, classic, well-known, and Ruslan Salakudinov, who was uh, later invited to lead Apple <laughs> AI. So uh, these are very uh, famous people. But back then, so they were working in the same university. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton uh, spoke with Ruslan, and as a result was this work. So back then, computers were slow, right? They wanted to try to train neural network, which consists of multiple layers. And they trained it like this. So given the first layer, they trained the second layer. So it was trained completely separately. Then given the second layer, they trained the third layer and so on. So they, they were going forward doing the training. And uh, well, this approach worked. So uh, this was uh, very interesting and this is, uh, called deep belief network. Uh, remember the word belief from Bayesian, right? And deep because it has multiple layers and network because it's like artificial neural network. Okay, uh, when uh, you have two layers, uh, this is called a restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, and uh, Okay, I will not go deeper into this, but I just want you to, to hear this, these terms. Okay, uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, as with, with an example of two medical tests. As we uh, do one test, we estimate the probability of having disease. Then you do another step, you like improve your understanding and so on. So you can do uh, step after step and uh, get better and better uh, like, uh, information. Uh, so this is uh, kind of the idea of Bayesian optimization. So it's a sequential optimization strategy. So we're optimizing a black box system uh, without calculating derivatives. Uh, Bayesian optimization is typically used to find optimal hyperparameters for machine learning models, for example. It is better than grid search or random search, right? Bayesian optimization works uh, by constructing a posterior distribution of functions that best describe function you want to optimize and so on. Again, I will not go into this, but uh, just for you to understand. So you, you kind of, you do preliminary estimation and then given like you do the first medical test and then given this preliminary estimation, then you do more and more and more granular. And this is of course better than just do like a stupid uh, grid search or something like that. Okay, uh, Bayesian inference, Bayesian estimation. You will so, uh, see it multiple times. So you have a posterior, which is the data you actually see. Like for example, you have some sort of distribution. Uh, you have prior, and this is distribution of something which you don't know but you may estimate it reasonably. And then you have some sort of likelihood uh, and then you connect them together. And uh, this type of calculations uh, you will see over and over again and we'll have some examples uh, like in, in this. So here, uh, example, how many children can read? So we have a sample of 10 children three of them are literate, so they can read. So here you have 10 children and three of them in color, they can read. We need to evaluate the literacy rate, which is percentage of children who can read in the population, right? So on one side you say, well, that's all I have. I have the sample. So it's got to be 30%. Like I really don't know, maybe it's more than it's less because I don't have enough data, okay? Uh, but you can put a little bit more thinking about it and uh, uh, 
maybe you'll come up with something more reasonable. At least you can estimate uh, like to which uh, like maybe possible error the region. Like, so we presume that children are independent, that population is uniform, and uh, we can use binomial distribution for likelihood function. So here is uh, the example. Uh, this is actually was uh, generated uh, on a computer just uh, to test different things. So we start with a flat prior. You see flat prior. We treat beliefs as probability. So we try different uh, prior functions. Then we can estimate the likelihood function from observed data as binomial distribution. And finally, we calculate posterior distribution using base formula. And uh, Whatever. So you see how this uh, green posterior may change depending on the selection of prior and likelihood. Okay. Uh, uh, so in most cases, this approach actually is not very useful, but sometimes it is. But I, I just want you to, uh, to know this logic. Okay. Here is an example of exponential distribution. So we have 50 points, 50 data samples, 50 observations. And uh, it looks like if we make a histogram, it looks like exponential distribution. So we want to find the, the lambda, uh, the, the value of, of, of the lambda. So this is described in this video. And there are uh, two ways how, how you do it. And you estimate the lambda and you estimate kind of the width, the region, the distribution. That's why all this uh, reasoning is, is useful. Um, and you, you can make a generative model, so you can generate multiple values and uh, uh, see what you can get and how it fits with actual data. Uh, okay, uh, here's another example. I, I will just keep it because it's already half an hour. Okay, here's a coin uh, bias estimation. Again, uh, uh, we uh, need to, to know if the coin is fair or not, right? So we need to estimate probability of giving heads or tails. Uh, and uh, we don't know. So we start with some subjective belief. We flip a coin one time, we get heads. From this, we create likelihood distribution showing probability and, and so on. Okay, again, we'll not go through this. We'll not go through this either. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, the, the, this is again a similar example. We have 100 damaged flash drives, 80 of them have coffee stain on them. Estimate probability and credible interval that coffee is causing the damage, right? So we have all drives, we have drives which have uh, coffee stain and we have drives which are damaged. We don't actually know, is it look, looking like this or it's looking like this, right? So we, uh, we can use Bayesian theorem to like, make some formulas, right? And uh, well, presuming uh, some reasonable uh, like uh, proportion of drives having coffee stains, whatever, uh, we can try to uh, estimate like, uh, how coffee is causing damage or not. It's not exact, right? It's just giving you an idea in the uh, region. Okay, this, this is a famous example uh, discussed on this YouTube. Uh, so suppose you're getting socks out of the washing machine and the first 11 socks are distinct. So they're all different. So this suggests that there are a lot more socks inside the machine, but how many, <laughs> like how many socks? And again, you don't know really. Uh, so what you can do, uh, you can, uh, can come up with some uh, distribution, possible distribution of number of socks, and you can come up with the possible distribution of proportion of pairs. So you may have pairs of socks and you have a single socks with no pair. And so this is example, and this is of course arbitrary. So you do something like that. And then uh, going from the prior, which is number of socks, 
and you through some uh, generative experiments you get to some sort of posterior and then you take the best guess and in this case it was 44 which is like a median of this distribution what's funny is that when he compared with the actual number actual number was 45 so this approach well estimated number of socks pretty well so uh, well inter interesting so it, it actually makes sense right uh Bayesian versus frequentist um this is just a, a link to the lecture which uh, by jake Vanderplas, which i highly highly recommend and uh, these are tools and libraries uh, which you can use and these are uh, several examples uh, or problems which you can solve uh, just to learn this this way of thinking uh, Okay, this is uh, the end, end of the presentation. I will stop the recording now.